And today, that's uh, the title of our uh, event today is called After Order, Europe Transition to a Post-Western World, 1989 to 2023, uh, uh, given by Professor Timson Gatton Nash. Now, before getting into the introduction of uh, uh, Professor Timson Gatton Nash, I would like to firstly express uh, our thanks to the Borgrim Institute and the Borgrim China Center uh, and especially uh, to uh, Xiao Jiao and Xin Wei, uh, who has given us enormous support uh, for this event. And also thanks to the School of International Studies uh, at Peking University, and who kindly uh, shared uh, uh, the event. And I believe many of you here actually found the European Studies community within China. Um, so thank you very much for your participation. Uh, now today's event we scheduled uh, within a two hour framework. Uh, so in the first hour, it will be a lecture given by Professor Gaden Ash. Uh, and then I will start with a few questions and then open the Q&A session uh, to our audience. Uh, so throughout the uh, our talk, do feel free uh, if you want to send in any questions uh, in the Q&A or send it to any of the staff that you can reach. Uh, and we'll get into the Q&A session uh, in the second part uh, of today's talk. Uh, now, the introduction of our honorable guest today, um, Professor Gatton Nash, uh, who is a professor of European studies uh, in University of Oxford, and is a Berlin fellow at St. Anist College, and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. Um, and for many years, uh, he has been directing the Darendel program uh, for the study of freedom at Oxford. Uh, many of us came to know um, Professor Gatinaj throughout uh, his books, um, political writings, uh, and the uh, history of the president, uh, including The Magical Lantern, uh, The File, uh, Free Speech, uh, to name a few, basically. And uh, many of us are, are also his fellow readers um, of his uh, column on international affairs in The Guardian. Uh, and his most recent book, which is exactly the book which I'm holding right now in my hand, uh, Homelands, A Personal History of Europe, uh, is published this year um, and draws on more than half a century of travel and experience and tells the story of Europe, uh, basically after the Second World War, until early 21st century. And in this book, I noticed there's a very interesting phrasing, uh, which Professor Gatanash referred to himself as a spy of truth. It's so not a real spy, but a spy of truth, uh, to referring that to his uh, to his appearance that in 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 terms of traveling and writing about the political events, I think what have triggered us and attracted us in Professor Gatton's writing and research is that his ability to connect or to bridge the individual experience uh, with the grand history and political events uh, behind. Um, so instead of talking about the spy of truth, I think the, in a way, the phrase I prefer to, to associate Professor Gatanash with is the witness of the personal and also the global. And among all the experiences that Professor Gatanash gathered over the decades, I think Europe is definitely at the center of it. So I think today that we probably have one of the most suitable candidates uh, to talk about Europe uh, for today. And Professor Gatanash also came with a very ambitious title that's called Europe Transition uh, to a Post-Western World, 1989 to 2023. And as we know that basically Europe is in a constant process of repositioning. Um, uh, basically after Second World War or even after First World War, it is in a way always trying to find and restore the order within the continent and maybe to the globe by extension. So arguably, maybe one of the central political mission for Europe is about finding order. So right now that we're entering, I think both within Europe and also the global society, is entering another period of great turbulence and uncertainty. So this is the time that maybe we should ask again uh, that how did Europe uh, responded respond to chaos before um, and what is its responses right now? And how will that response reshape uh, the world that we live in 
in connection with other regional uh, and global actors. So we look forward to hearing from Professor Ganesh right now. So the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Good morning to those of you in China. Good evening to those of you in the United States. And uh, I'm tempted to say good night to those of you in Europe, because of course it's uh, night time in Europe. So the picture you have behind me is of Oxford. It's a particularly well-known, if not notorious, building in Oxford. I'm actually speaking to you from Stanford, my other academic home. And I want to start by signaling how glad I am at the academic relationship between the University of Oxford and Peking University. I was actually fortunate enough to be one of the initiators of the initial agreement, which we signed with Professor Li Chang, who was then director of the Center for European Studies at, uh, at Peking University, which is still in existence and is an agreement on both Chinese studies and European studies uh, between the two universities. And of course, more recently, um, and, and as part of the context for this talk, um, we have uh, a partnership between Oxford um, and Peking University, amongst others, in this project which you see on your screen, Europe in a Changing World which is a quite remarkable academic collaboration uh, across 15 time zones. So I'm at Stanford right there out in the West. Um, you're at the far Eastern end there, universities in India, Turkey, Russia, the United States, China, and many European countries. Um, I want to express my appreciation particularly to Professor Wang Jize, um, for his support for this project and to Professor Liu. And I do think that this kind of academic collaboration and dialogue is particularly important um, at times of growing international tension. Um, this talk takes off, as Professor Liu said, from my new book, Homelands, which I hope one day will be available in Chinese. There it is in a number of different European languages already. Um, what you can do is to go on the website, timothygartnash.com, and at least see the different editions, and also this photo gallery from the book, which is very relevant to what I'm about to talk about. Um, so do take a look there. My talk is essentially in two halves. The first part is describing the trajectory that Europe has gone through to some extent since 1945, but above all, in what I call the post-wall period. The period that starts with the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November, 1989, and I argue ends with Vladimir Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, 2022. That's the first part. The second part will be more speculative. It will be looking at the transition to whatever the new period is. And of course, we don't yet know exactly what it is, but one working title would be a post-Western period and posing the question, of order for discussion. So let me start with the first part of my talk, talk on the European trajectory. And I'm just gonna share a map with you from the book. This will be entirely familiar to all the European specialists, but just to remind you of what Europe looked like, particularly for students, uh, before 1989. So before what I call the post-wall era, we had what the historian Tony Judd called the post-war era. Europe 
which had been the geopolitical power center of the world for at least a century from 1815 to 1914, tore itself apart in what has been called the European Civil War, or what Winston Churchill called a new 30 years war between 1914 and 1945. So that by the end of that 30 year period, Europe was no longer the geopolitical center of the world and into the heart of Europe had come the two new superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union and had divided Europe with what you see on the map there, the Iron Curtain running right the way down the center of the continent with American troops up to the edge on one side and Soviet Russian troops on the other. So Europe was no longer the geopolitical center of the world, but it was still the central theater of geopolitics, right? So we had, if we're talking orders, essentially a bipolar world. Obviously, there were other players of which China was one, but in the perception of the time, it was essentially a bipolar world. Europe was a divided center of a divided world. Germany, Europe's central power, was the divided center of a divided Europe. And Berlin, which you see there, was the divided center of a divided Germany in a divided Europe, in a divided world. So that to live in Berlin at that time was to be at the epicenter of a global competition uh, in a bipolar world. Now, this takes us to 1989 uh, in a fashion which with hindsight can come to be seen as inevitable, but that's a big mistake because actually it was a one in a million example of historical luck, what Machiavelli calls Fortuna. In just three years, 1989 to the end of 1991, this entire Soviet empire softly and suddenly vanished away with hardly a shot fired in anger. And we entered into, after the 9th of November, 1989, what I am calling the post-wall era. Um, here we are, Europe today, a very different map, no Iron Curtain down the middle, Germany united, but an extraordinary patchwork of states right the way down Central and Eastern Europe, many of which didn't exist before 1989. By the way, most of the, there are more new frontiers in Europe than there are in Africa. And then as you see to the East, the areas occupied by Russian forces uh, in Georgia, in Moldova, and of course in Ukraine. So what happened to Europe in the post-war era? And let me just remind you that at the beginning of 1989, there was no European Union. Europe was still divided. There wasn't even a European single market that had not yet been brought into existence. There certainly wasn't a single European currency. The European community had only 12 members. NATO had only 15 uh, members. And many of the features we associate with Europe today, for example, freedom of movement or the Schengen area hardly existed. So actually, if you took a a European teenager today and transported them back into the Europe of early 1989, they would hardly recognize it. Um, they would regard it as profoundly anachronistic. Okay, so what happens in the post-wall era? Essentially, it's a story of two halves. 
from the point of view of a liberal European, and I speak as a liberal European, the first half, which goes from 1989 to 2007, is a story of extraordinary progress, an extraordinary enlargement of the area of freedom, of liberal democracy, extraordinary steps forward in European integration, a process unique on the planet, and an enlargement of the geopolitical West. Notably, it's two key institutions, the EU and NATO. So I mentioned 12 members of the European community in 1989, 15 of NATO. By 2007, 27 members of the European Union, 25 members of uh, of NATO, stretching all the way up, if you look on the map, top right, to these countries here, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltic states, which did not exist on the map of Europe, the political map of Europe in 1989, although they continue to exist in the hearts and minds of their own people, because they were part of the Soviet Union. And here they are now, um, liberal democracies, members of both the EU and NATO. Uh, in this period, we get the European Union, we get a single currency, the Euro, an extraordinary uh, experiment. Um, we get something close to a European constitution. It's not actually the constitutional treaty, it's the Lisbon Treaty, but nonetheless, we get this extraordinary enlargement of the EU. We get the establishment of freedom of movement so that European citizens can work, study, and live anywhere in the European Union. We get the much larger Schengen area with freedom of travel. Of course, this is not a story of unabated and continuous progress. That's never how history works. So this is also the period of five wars in former Yugoslavia, um, beginning in Slovenia in 1992 through Croatia, Bosnia, uh, at Kosovo, and ending in what we now call North Macedonia um, as late as 2002. So over a whole decade, five wars, uh, which give you this patchwork of small states in former Yugoslavia. It's also the period of 9-11, the 11th of September 2001 terrorist attacks on the United States. But interestingly, I think, and we might want to discuss this, that while 9-11 is clearly a turning point in Mid uh, Middle Eastern history, it's clearly a turning point in US history. It's also, to some extent, one might argue, a turning point in relations between the United States and China because, of course, the relationship with China changes very significantly after 9-11. I don't think it's a major turning point in European history. I argue that the major turning point between those two halves is 2008. 2008, simultaneously, uh, in the summer of that year, you have the beginning of the global financial crisis with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and you have Vladimir Putin's armed occupation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, these two large parts of the sovereign territory of Georgia, bottom right uh, on the map. And those two developments, more or less simultaneous, start what I call a downward turn a cascade of crises, one after the other, that continues for the next 15 years. So the global financial crisis segues, transitions into what is often called the Great Recession in many European economies, for example, in my own country, Britain, 
But more importantly, it triggers the Eurozone crisis, which many economists had foreseen. The economists said, if you have such a large a currency area, a very diverse economies, a single currency without a single treasury, then an asymmetric shock will produce extraordinary strains within that currency area. That is precisely what happened in 2010. The asymmetric shock of the global financial crisis catalyzed, and I can't emphasize this too much, a Eurozone crisis which dragged on for many, many years with huge impact on South European economies. Greek economy had 50% youth unemployment and um, uh, lost 25% of its GDP and had a major impact on the whole European project. Also in 2010, Viktor Orban, the newly re-elected uh, prime minister of Hungary, starts the demolition, the erosion, the dismantling of what was still a very fragile post-communist liberal democracy in Hungary. Um, and he does this in a Hungary which is a full member state of the European Union. Interestingly, there is a connection here with 2008 and with China. Because, of course, 2008 triggered the, the crisis of Western democratic capitalism. But at the same time with the Beijing Olympics, it's a moment where China emerges on the world stage, or at least is seen to emerge as a new superpower. And Viktor Orban, in justifying what he was doing, said, we don't need to have liberal democracy, we can have illiberal democracy. And he argued the future of modernity does not necessarily belong to liberal systems. And he pointed specifically to China. So there's an interesting connection there. 2014, of course, Vladimir Putin seizes Crimea. You can see it there on the map and starts in this corner of Eastern Ukraine the Russo-Ukrainian war, which has now been going on for more than nine years. Um, 2015, the refugee crisis, um, refugees from the wider Middle East, particularly from Syria, coming into Europe through a number of routes. Just two million people enter Europe within two years, but this is enough in terms of uncontrolled immigration to trigger a sharp swing to the nationalist populist right. So that a party called the Alternative für Deutschland, the AFD in Germany does spectacularly well in the German elections in 2017, becomes the leading opposition party in the Bundestag and Marine Le Pen does extremely well in the French presidential elections in 2017 and populists in countries like Poland also do extremely well. 2016, of course, you have Brexit, which results in my own country, Britain, leaving the EU and the election of Donald Trump, um, which is itself a major crisis for Europe in many ways, but also an encouragement for the nationalist populist forces in Europe. And then we go through to the COVID pandemic, and all the way down in this cascade of crisis to the 24th of February, 2022, Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the largest war in Europe since 1945, still going on as we speak on an unprecedented scale, just to give you one statistic. Ukrainian war dead are estimated by the United States in a country of 40 million, roughly, to have been in the first year and a half of the war between 70,000 and about 100,000. That's fatalities. The entire fatalities of the United States in nearly two decades of involvement in Vietnam were 58,000. Right. So in just a year and a half, Ukraine, a country of only 40 million people, 
has lost in its war dead more people than the United States in the entirety of the Vietnam War. Um, a, an absolute shock to Europe. Now, it's, it's important to emphasize that just as that first period was not one of um, simply a progress, this second period is not one simply of regress because the European Union has not only survived these crises, but in significant respects has actually got stronger, right? So that in response to the COVID pandemic, it produced this extraordinary funding called the Next Generation EU, 750 billion euros, which broke two taboos that long been upheld by North European creditor states in the European Union. Namely, effectively, this was neutralized debt. So the European condition, Commission was empowered to borrow on behalf of the whole European Union, i.e. all the member states are jointly responsible. And half of it was given out in grants rather than in loans. So what many would argue the European should have done 10 years before in response to the Eurozone crisis it did in response to the COVID crisis, which also hit Southern Europe particularly hard. The European Union has shown remarkable unity in response to uh, the full-scale war in Ukraine. So it's it's not all regress, but nonetheless, nonetheless, there is a really significant question to be asked, which is why this downward turn? Why after such a period of extraordinary progress a period of such regress. And let me very briefly mention a few reasons, and then I'm going to move on to the where we are now. I think a large part of the explanation is to be found in that old Greek word hubris, denoting excessive or delusional self-confidence. The hubris of the United States believing that simply by marching into Iraq, it could create a new democracy like, like that in Czechoslovakia or Poland. The hubris of Tony Blair's Cool Britannia, which is a great example of what the German sociologist called, and I called Andreas Reckwitz calls, apatistic liberalism. The liberalism of opening on all fronts, the belief that you, you open your frontiers, open your economy, open your country to immigration, open your culture, there's not going to be a reaction. The hubris of my friends in East Central Europe believing that membership in the EU would secure a consolidated democracy, the hubris of the Eurozone, which I've talked about, the hubris, and this is very relevant to our topic today, of a European Union, which in this period, at least in its rhetorical self-understanding, believed that it was being a pioneer of global governance, that it was pioneering a model of multi-level, to some extent, post-national governance, which the world would graciously follow a book from that era, Mark Leonard's, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. The hubris of a globalized, financialized capitalism, which persuaded itself that global aggregate gains would not only justify, but actually compensate for specific local losses. Right. So, of course, there were major gains. In a sense, globalization could be argued to have lifted hundreds of millions of people in China and India out of poverty. But that didn't compensate those who lost out in the Rust Belt of the United States or the post-industrial north of England or the northeast of France. And they were the ones who voted for the populace. The hubris of a liberalism which was essentially reduced to one dimension, economic liberalism, and the hubris of believing that peace 
could be secured on the continent of Europe um, by non-military means, by forms of collective security, diplomacy, negotiation, dialogue, and economic inter interdependence. So that, for example, it was held that even after 2014 and Putin's occupation of Crimea, energy dependence on Russia was in itself a good thing because it was held that it would underpin the peace. Um, an illusion that was rather dramatically destroyed on the 24th of February, 2022. Now, underpinning all these different versions of hubris was, I think, what I would call a historiosophical mistake, a mistake in how we liberal Europeans and liberal Americans thought about history. Put most simply, this was a fallacy of extrapolation. We took the way things had gone between 1989 and 2007, namely from a liberal point of view very well, and simply extrapolated that forward. We took the most non-linear event in modern history, namely the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. As I said, a one in a million example of historical luck and made from it a linear projection. We took history, as we would say in English, with a small h, which is always the product of an interaction between deep structure and process on the one hand and conjuncture, chance, choice, contingency, collective will, and individual leadership on the other. That's how history really happens. And we turned it into history with a capital H, a Hegelian process of inevitable progress towards freedom. And there's nothing inevitable about progress towards freedom. Let me note two things on that. First of all, no country fell prey to these illusions, and in particular to that historiosophical illusion, more than the country of Hegel himself, Germany. Germany is the locus classicus of, of these illusions. And secondly, you may be thinking, because you're a very well-informed audience, ah, oh, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, that moment of liberal triumphalism. Let me disagree. Actually, although of course there was some liberal triumphalism in the early 1990s, it was in the West and in Europe in particular, a period of great uncertainty. We had no idea whether the transition from a centrally planned economy to a market economy, um, from a communist system to a Western liberal democratic system could work. No idea whether we could build a European Union, let alone a single currency, let alone enlarge that European enlarged uh, Union, enlarge NATO, and so on. Everything still remained to be done. The, the hubris and the illusions about history with a capital H came in full force in the mid, early to mid 2000s, because that was the moment Remember EU enlargement and NATO enlargement, 1999, 2004, 2007. That was the moment at which everything seemed to have gone so well. Mission accomplished, to coin a phrase. And that was precisely the moment, of course, at which the crisis set in. So now I come to the second part of my talk and that which I hope will lead on to the discussion. The shock of the return of a major war to Europe and the transition to a different period and a very different context, which for discussion might be called post-Western. So post-war, post-war, and now post-Western. Okay, so of course the first shock is that we didn't manage to prevent peace on our own continent, that we have this huge war going on. 
The second shock is that witnessing such a major war of, in our view, unprovoked brutal aggression, a war of recolonization against Ukraine, it turns out that a great deal of the world simply does not agree with the West's assessment of um, what is happening. So um, this is, I mentioned our project on Europe in a changing world. At the end of last year, beginning of this year, we did some polling in China, India, Turkey, Russia, and the US, as well as in uh, Britain and, and the EU. And have a look at this one result, which best reflects your view on what Russia is to your country. So as you can see, there's consensus in the West that it is an adversary over 50% in each case, or at best a rival. But look at India, look at Ch China, look at Turkey. Um, an ally or a necessary partner. Actually, India is quite re remarkable in this respect because India regards the US, the EU, and Britain also as allies or necessary partners, and Russia. So that these now great powers, non-Western great powers, simply have a fundamentally different understanding of what is happening in Ukraine and of the relationship with Russia. And this was, of course, visibly expressed at the um, BRICS summit very recently with the presidents of um, Brazil, South Africa, China and India, well, the Prime Minister of India, uh, cheerfully joining hands with Mr. Lavrov, the Foreign Minister of Russia. Um, a first reaction to this in the West was a kind of fevered discussion about how we had, quote unquote, lost the global South, right? And how we might, we the West, might win back the global South. Um, this is, in my view, a fundamental misunderstanding. Um, the term the global South is, in my view, but others may disagree, itself part of the problem because it suggests a kind of undifferentiated mass of countries in the rest of the world, which have somehow to be won over the true and right cause of the West, or if you will, the North. It has in a sense a neo-colonial element to it. And a colleague of mine at Oxford, Faisal Devji, who's a historian of India, points out that India, which likes to speak of the global South, doesn't think of itself as part of the global South. It'd be interesting to know what is the case with China. What in fact we have here is a world of new and old great powers. So in a sense, the paradox of this moment is that on the one hand, the war in Ukraine has actually strengthened and consolidated the West. Remember that a couple of years ago, President Emmanuel Macron of France was talking about NATO as brain dead, right? There was felt to be an utter crisis of purpose for NATO. No sense of that now. And in fact, EU and NATO are coming ever closer together so that Finland and Sweden which for many years were EU members, but not NATO members, have now joined NATO. And those countries in Southeastern Europe, which are members of NATO, but not of the EU, are now looking very much to join the EU and being encouraged to do so. So that suddenly what you have, and this is part of my European story, is after a period in which between 2008 and 2022, 
essentially the process of the enlargement of the geopolitical West, which I talked about, of NATO and EU, had fundamentally stalled. One country came into the EU, Croatia, one country left, Britain, third remained 27. Three, three small countries in the Balkans came into NATO, but geopolitically of scant significance. Essentially, the process had stalled. Suddenly, in response to the war, you have a really serious discussion once again about enlargement. Ukraine and Moldova have been accepted as candidates for EU membership. Georgia has been sent very positive signals. People are again talking seriously about enlargement to the Western Balkans. Um, and a token of the seriousness is that people are talking about how to reform the EU to make an EU of 36 member states work. And by the way, you also have a serious discussion about NATO enlargement. So again, the process that stalled at the Bucharest summit of NATO in 2008 has been kick-started again by the war in Ukraine. Heraclitus says, war is the father of all things. And there is a serious prospect that in five to 10 years time, you will have not only an EU of, of 36 member states, you will also have a larger NATO, including Ukraine, Moldova, and possibly even Georgia. And you will have what I call a post-imperial Europe. Maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. But at the same time, as you having this great strengthening of the West, we seem to be moving towards a quote-unquote post-Western world. Now, what on earth does post-Western mean? Professor Liu, this would be something it would be really interesting to discuss. Does it mean non-Western? Does it mean anti-Western? Or does it mean following the West, i.e. in some sense a successor to the West, but carrying forward a, a heritage from the West? And what is this West we're talking about? Is it geographical? In which case, is Japan really part of the West? Is it cultural and historical, in which case we're talking about 2,500 years of history starting in ancient Greece and Rome? Is it some set of ideas or scientific or technological or social practices? But in that case, many of the countries I've just been talking about have a large part of the West within them. There's a completely forgotten book by a man called Theo von Lauer called The World Revolution of Westernization, right? The World Revolution of Westernization that followed European colonialism and then Western supremacy, so that countries which we talk about loosely as non-Western actually have a great deal of the West in their ideologies, their science, their technology, their social practices, their education. Um, is, it, um, is it the West as a geopolitical actor? Because if we're talking about the West as a geopolitical actor, that only came into existence during the Second World War in response to a common enemy, namely Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, the United States and Western Europe, and then remained in existence throughout the Cold War in response to another common enemy, namely initially Joseph Stalin and then his successors in the Soviet Union. So ever since the end of the Cold War, there has been a big question mark about the consistency and coherence of the geopolitical West based on the question whether we, we still have a common threat perception. And of course, key to that are two countries, Russia on the one hand and China on the other, where many would see a divergent threat perception between the United States and Europe. What, however, I think we can say and where this term 
I think is useful as a shorthand, is that we have seen the end of a long period in which the West, in one form or another, has been setting the agenda and able to set the agenda of world politics, starting, of course, with European colonialism through the 19th century, then with the United States and the Soviet Union, question mark, to what extent is the Soviet Union in some sense also a Western power? We might want to talk about that, but certainly Marxism, Leninism is an ideology that has its origins very firmly in the West. And the irony here is that it's precisely the moment of the greatest triumph of the West, 1989, which begins the process of the transition to a post-Western world. This is something I've been thinking about quite a bit. It's a, it's an argument I've been developing, so I'd love to talk about it. And that had two parts. One part of it is what I touched on in terms of hubris. It was the ideological competition with fascism and then with communism, which kept the West on its toes, which kept its competitive, which, for example, encouraged it to develop effective welfare states, as well as dynamic economies. Absent the major ideological competition, which was Francis Fukuyama's point, the West became lazy, complacent, and hubristic. And that took us into the post-2009, 2008 crisis. On the other hand, at the same time, the consequence of the triumph of the West, which was globalization, of course, facilitated the rise of, for want of a better shorthand, the rest of countries like China and India, but also Turkey and Brazil and South Africa. I remember, Professor Liu, um, when my son lived in Beijing many years ago, going to see an exhibition at the National Museum on Tiananmen Square, this was an exhibition that actually came from the British Museum. It was called A History of the World in a Hundred Objects. And the Chinese curators of the museum had added a hundred and first object. And you'll never guess what it was. It was the pen, a rather ordinary ballpoint pen, with which the Chinese representative had signed China into the World Trade Organization, the WTO. That was object 101. But there's a kind of truth in that because that little pen actually stands for this opportunity of globalization, which of course China above all, but also powers, other powers seized. Okay, so now where are we? So some people would say, and again, this is all for discussion, we're heading back towards a multipolar world and maybe Europe, is one pole of that world, the United States another, China a third. This was, of course, a view that when I first started engaging with China, um, was very popular with specialists in Beijing. I remember, I think some colleagues who I interacted with at that time are, uh, are on this, uh, in this webinar, um, that against what was then the American unipolarity, the idea of the unipolar world under George W. Bush, Europe would be encouraged as another pole of a multipolar world. And I, I sense from some of our conversations uh, in Oxford and elsewhere that this notion may be coming back. I have to say to you that I'm extremely skeptical of the extent to which this is actually going to come about for, for three reasons. First of all, because there's a question about how coherent an actor in international affairs the European Union is going to be altogether, including, by the way, without Britain. Secondly, because half the member states of the European Union 
are now East European, Central and East European countries. They are profoundly Atlanticist. For them, the US and Europe, NATO and EU are two sides of the same coin. Uh, the minister responsible in Ukraine at the moment uh, is called the Minister for Euro-Atlantic Integration. She has a, a backdrop which shows Ukraine linking EU and NATO. So they're not going to want to see anything of the kind which President Emmanuel Macron hinted at on his on the plane on the way back from China. Europe is a separate pole with a quite distinctive approach to questions like uh, Taiwan, but particularly in the context of the war in Ukraine, which is by no means over. For East European countries, but not just for East European countries, that means that your primary threat is Russia. It's a direct security, even a military threat. And for that, you need the United States because your security is guaranteed by NATO, right? Uh, and of course, as we know, Washington is putting Europe on the spot in terms of its relations with China. So I'm not for a moment going to argue that European policy on China is going to be identical to that of the United States. That's not the point. But I think it would be a mistake to think there's going to be a really fundamental divergence and that the European Union will have a really consistent approach as a different pole in relations with China, amongst other things. And my third point is that what I think we're really getting is not a world of multipolarity, but a world of multi-alignment, or to be more accurate, of multi-aligning powers. So as I think some of you know, multi-alignment is a term which, to my knowledge, was co-coined by Prime Minister Modi when trying to make the distinction between the old Indian policy of non-alignment and the new Indian policy of, he said, multi-alignment. Multi-alignment is different from multipolarity. Multi-alignment means what we saw on that uh, opinion poll um, graph. It means that you align with Russia on one issue, with Turkey on another, and with the United States on the third. And your alignment two years ago may not be your alignment today. And that very well describes the behavior of powers like India, China, South Africa, but also, by the way, of some European countries like Serbia or Viktor Orban's Hungary. They're multi-aligning. And by the way, if President Trump is re-elected president of the United States in 2025, uh, it may be the policy of the United States as well. So this is what I think we're, we're really getting, um, which is a world of multi-aligning powers. And by the way, this also means what we're not getting is something that I myself argued for in a book called Free World, uh, published in 20, uh, 2004, which is to go beyond the West to a wider community of democracies. Very much the idea of Joe Biden. This again is from our ECFR, Europe in a Changing World polling, which of the following quotes comes closest to having a real democracy. Now, we may ask questions about the 77% figure for China, 57% for India, Turkey, a plurality, even Russia, not quite a plurality. But the point here is that the language of democracy has become so universal that everyone is speaking about themselves in terms of democracy and to some a greater or lesser extent being believed as such. In other words, it doesn't have that traction. But anyway, in the alignment that I talked about, the BRICS alignments, 
those who are still comfortable in their relationship with Russia, is the world's largest democracy, India and South Africa and Brazil. So democracy, at least at the moment, does not seem to be the defining variable of your conduct in international relations. To put this a different way, and here I'm drawing my remarks to a close, as I mentioned, in the early 2000s, Europeans liked to believe that the world was going their way, that the world was gradually going to follow the example of an integrated, to some extent, post-national, multi-level governance European Union, that the world was going to follow the example of Europe in the late 20th century. Actually, I think we can argue that the world looks much more like the Europe of the late 19th century. That is to say, writ large, a world of greater and smaller powers essentially pursuing their own national interests in the light of their own values. But with the difference, of course, that unlike in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century, we face unprecedented global challenges. Uh, in July this year, for the first time, global temperatures exceeding the UN, exceeded the UN target of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. Pandemics we saw in the COVID years, the internet, AI, um, the huge growth in world population and accompanying poverty. In other words, the demand for global governance has spectacularly increased at precisely a moment when the supply of it seems to be diminishing. Uh, so that for Europe as a continent, with all its real achievements, and I want to stress that achievements, um, this new question mark post-Western world is an extremely challenging one, much more challenging than the world looked after 1989. And it brings us back to those two familiar dilemmas. How do we strike the balance between our interests and our values? And how do we strike the balance between competition and cooperation? And for that, we need in that famous formula, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And with that, I think exactly on the hour, let me conclude and I look forward very much to the discussion. Right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ganesh. And uh, this is such a brilliant talk. And, and thank you for giving us, first of all, the, like the trajectory in connection, of course, with your personal experience of the European history. And then later on, more of forward looking i think this is the perspective in a way where we're lacking now because i think that's not only in europe but, pro but probably across the globe there's a tendency of this kind of backward looking ideologies about about the revival of the glorious past of different countries by their politicians but rather i think the key question is about how do we continue to look forward right um and before i already see there's a like a like um a number of questions being posted uh, by the audience. But before getting to the uh, audience questions, there are like two or three questions which I want to use as maybe as a start for the discussion. Um, and I will jump into the hard one, actually, um, because um, Professor Ganesh and I actually, we all in a way shared our, um, there's a part of the troubles we shared in the past few months that both uh, uh, Professor Gadash and I went to Ukraine um, on the field. And I think that one of the key thing there when I was listening to the Ukrainian counterpart talking about the post-war order in Europe, about the Ukraine integration into either European Union, either into the NATO or into the European order, there's a big factor 
which that everyone seemed to be reluctant to discuss about is that the Russian role and the Russian position in a post war, right? like despite about how this war will, will actually conclude, but how we actually position and situate Russia in a post war order in Europe. I think this is the question maybe that Europe has encountered before. And this is a question has been a very thorny and challenging one right now. When we're trying to imagine a post-war, a post-Ukrainian war order in Europe, where is the position of Russia? So, of course, it's a question we all think about. Um, and the answer to it can only be given by the Russians. We have neither the right nor the power to give that answer for Russia. Mm -hmm. Unless you accept, which I do not, uh, a geopolitics and international order of spheres of influence, in other words, of empires, we cannot accept, and we must support the Ukrainians in not accepting, that Russia has some special, unique um, veto rights over Ukraine. Um, and that's very difficult for the Russians to accept because this is a part of their empire going back not just decades, but centuries. And so I think the precondition for Russia, the Russians themselves, beginning to face up to this, is for them to accept that they have in fact lost an empire. Now, let me tell you, as coming from a country that lost an empire, losing an empire is difficult to do. People don't like it. it. Takes a long time. You'll remember Dean Asherson, the US Secretary of State, said in the early 1960s that Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a role. And some would say 60 years later, it's still true. So these processes take time, but that's what the starting point has to be, um, which is accepting that you've lost an empire, starting to find a role. And that's more difficult for Russia because unlike Britain or France or Portugal or Spain, Russia has been nothing but an empire for nearly 300 years. It doesn't have a classic nation state to go back to, okay? Now, in terms of the thinking about European order, um, let me tell you about an encounter which I describe in the book, because I think this will be of interest to, to people on this call, which was I was summoned to the White House to brief President George W. Bush in May 2001 before his first visit to Europe and his first meeting with Vladimir Putin. Right. By the way, at that point, Bush's obsession was China. He had a rather simple view of world geopolitics in which we'd had one great competitor, which is the Soviet Union. They'd lost. Now we had China, which, of course, all changed after 9-11. Um, but what we were discussing at that point was a pan-European security order, which would be built around a further enlargement of NATO. Right? So I see no reason in principle why NATO extended to the Baltic states and to Ukraine should not in time be extended to a democratic Russia. Now, I can see that might look different from a Chinese point of view, um, but, but thinking about it from the point of view of the European continent, and of course, Russia is partly in Europe, is partly European, it makes perfectly good sense. So I think there are major steps you could take towards the pan-European security system, uh, given the right Russia as a partner. Um, Last sentence on that, I can see that, and I, I can imagine that people in China might find that an unappealing prospect if it's viewed as an extension of American hegemony. But there's another way to think about it, which is as a factor of stability in the international system altogether. Right. Thank you for that. And my second question is in a way also related to one of the questions I saw that raised by the audience by Tim uh, Tenzin as well. Uh, 
So I think the question is that when we're actually reading about um, uh, both Professor Timson Gatton Ash's book and also uh, history books written by uh, other scholars that uh, specialize in, in the European history, I think they both point out, all of them point out this interesting phenomenon is that after 1989, uh, during the transitions, the previous Eastern Central European countries were in a catching up transition as we are catching up with Europe. We're returning to Europe in a way, this kind of narrative, narratives of returning. And very interesting that when China started opening up and reform, you know, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, it's also about China's returning uh, to the world. And then after 2008, probably the narrative turned into China's return to the center of the global stage. But it is a narrative of returning, right? But then I think with Brexit and um, probably up to 2008 in Europe, with the rise of the populist parties, suddenly the narrative became the narrative to leave Europe, uh, to get away from, you may say, the mainstream European frameworks. Um, Brexit is an example. The rise of populist parties are examples. Uh, and I think that probably Russia is also one of the examples. Because in the early 1990s, maybe, maybe the narrative was still about returning to Europe, but then gradually, uh, in a way, Russia uh, uh, gradually drifts away from these liberalist ideas in the late 1990s, and then later, of course, further away. So I think related to one of the questions that um, put out there by Tim is that, in a way, that why Europe is losing its appeal, or has lost its appeal from the early 1990s uh, till now. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I gave part of the answer. A, a, a continent which in so many ways is in crisis in such a mess is clearly less appealing. But um, having said that, of course, there's still an awful lot of countries that want to join. Um, even Turkey is reviving its conversation about its, um, its candidacy for EU membership. And of course, there are millions upon millions of people who are quite desperate to come to Europe. So let's not exaggerate Europe's loss of attractiveness. But what I would say to you is that I think Brexit is a big exception um, because Brexit was uh, Britain very foolish in my view, but also quite honestly, saying we don't like this project, we don't like the way it's going, so we're going to leave it. What you are getting now is not people all over Europe who want to leave it, but people who want to change it. And the agenda of, broadly speaking, the populist right now, be it Viktor Orban or Jaroslav Kaczynski in Poland or Marine Le Pen or the AFD or Vox in Spain, is to change Europe and specifically the European Union quite fundamentally from inside to identify Europe not with a set of enlightenment, liberal, universalist values, but with a set of traditionalist, Christian, nativist, particularist values, which, by the way, historically speaking, are also European values, right? Historically, they are European values. They're not the values of the European Union. And in that conversation, as I mentioned in the case of Viktor Orban, Putin, at least until the war in Ukraine, played a significant role because his embrace of traditional marriage, of religion, of the traditional family, of martial virtues, um, you know, a social conservative agenda, the strong nation, that is exactly the agenda of the populist right, so that the, uh, the, the challenge is, is more fundamental. The, the challenge is not countries A, B, and C leave. The country is that the EU is changed from within and increasingly dissociated from what I would think of as classic liberal democratic values. Mm. Yeah. And... Um... One final question that actually from my side, which is a question, of course, that we have been going through that um, in the previous conferences in Europe as well. I think one of the one of the key kind of um, uh, the challenge 
for Europe's uh, present status and also probably for its future is about defining its autonomy, Europe's autonomy, this very idea of autonomy. And of course, when talking about autonomy, people from different parts of the world talk about European autonomy with completely different understandings of it. I think that from the Chinese perspective, when they talk about the European autonomy, it's about the European security autonomy from the United States and probably from the NATO. But when I was in Europe, when people talk about autonomy, it's about the energy dependence on Russia, the economic dependence on China. Um, the first one, of course, is something that the Europe is on consensus to get rid of. The second one is in hotly debate. But I think the general opinion is that we have to be more cautious about the economic ties with China. And, <laughs> the third, and then the third level is the, uh, the autonomy, which is the security cooperation with the United States is the part which that the European counterpart are actually most feel secure and feels un like th there's no strong will to change it in a way. So there's a multiple levels of different autonomies associated with Europe. Um, but I, we want to hear about, and this is also, I think, part of the um, questions from the audience also pointing out, what is exactly the strategic autonomy for Europe in future? So um, we always quote, quote Confucius saying, I would start by the rectification of terms, because there's enormous confusion uh, around these terms. Um, so strategic autonomy, um, and you're quite right, it has the security dimension, it has the energy dimension, Increasingly, it has a supply chain dimension, rare metals and so on, chips, um, and and frankly, also overall economic dependence, of which, of course, Germany, with roughly 10% of GDP dependent one way or another on economic relations with China, is the most striking example, really stands out. But fundamentally, strategic autonomy is understood in the goalist sense, right? That is the approach of Charles de Gaulle, that Europe should be an autonomous superpower independent of the United States. That is a historical connotation that comes through with strategic autonomy, which is why in fact, most of the discourse is now around a different concept, namely European sovereignty. That's actually the term on which most people, I mean, Germans are very unhappy with strategic autonomy because it feels too goalist to them. So they want to talk about European sovereignty. But of course, sovereignty is itself a term that introduces conceptual confusion because strictly speaking, sovereignty is about authority, legal constitutional authority. And that's not what we're talking about here. When Emmanuel Macron talks about European sovereignty, what he really means is building up European power, mm. right? That's what I think it really means, is building up European power um, so that Europe has more power to defend its interests and its values. And, um, I mean, look, once again, the Ukraine war has shown us once again that Europe is light years away from strategic autonomy in the hard military field. We are, you know, almost as, we're not as dependent on the United States as 80 years ago, but, you know, we are massively still dependent on the United States and the East Europeans want us to remain so. So, um, I, I, I think for the foreseeable future, it's, it's a complete illusion to imagine a Europe moving very significantly in the direction of strategic autonomy understood uh, in the goalist sense, um, both because it's not realistic and because it would divide Europe, okay? But what I think you will get is a building up of European power in certain areas, also because of concerns about Donald Trump being re-elected president of the United States, which by the way, after two months in the United States, appears to me 
quite probable looking at the American politics um, on the one hand and, and then on the other hand in response to the to, to, to the war to the war in Ukraine and of course cautious de-risking in the supply chains and the economic and the energy security areas. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, elaboration on the very question of autonomy. And now um, I will move to Q&A uh, from the audience. I will read out some of the questions which I have not uh, asked previously, because some of the questions I've already integrated into my previous questions. Uh, so we have a question from Professor Wang Jisi, uh, said, uh, stimulating talk, and his question is about uh, the state councillor and right now also the serving uh, foreign minister in China, Wang Yi, claim that China is uh, doubtlessly part of the global south. In your opinion, what are the countries that are neither part of the West nor part of the global south? Do you agree with Wang Yi's statement of China's identity as compared to China's self-claimed identity of a third world country in the Cold War years. So it's a great pleasure, as always, to hear from Professor Wang. Um, and I think the best thing we could do in thinking about the Global South is to stop using the term Global South altogether. I think it introduces much more confusion than clarity. And in fact, my view would be that, um, as I mentioned in the talk, even some countries that talk in the name of the Global South don't think about themselves as a Global South. So um, I think that not just China, but India, Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, fundamentally don't think of themselves as part of the global south. They have a complex relationship to the West, but they think about themselves as themselves, as heirs to great traditions, great histories, and as new and old great powers. So I think what you're left with, and 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 rather, you see, it, it seems to me that part of the the impulse behind a lot of the, as it were, I saw there was a question about BRICS too, about the BRICS and all these movements. It's an impulse to reject all bipolar framings, right? So the bipolar framing north south, the bipolar framing west east, but also the bipolar framing democracy autocracy, the bipolar framing rich poor. Bipolar failing, powerful or weak. I think it's a it's a refusal of bipolar framing. So that my recipe, as a historian, is actually, if we're asked to think about these countries, think about China as China, India as India, Brazil as Brazil, Russia as Russia, and then of course to acknowledge that you have in sub-Saharan Africa, in other parts of the, of the southern half of the globe, a number of very poor, um, weak countries, which are not players in geopolitics in the way that the, that the great powers can be. Thank you for that. And... Um... If uh, Professor Wang has a follow-up question, that um, we can also ask uh, the program team to, if uh, Professor Wang right now is online, that we can get him to the panel for any follow-up discussion as well. Um, uh, meanwhile, uh, I can continue to read uh, of the questions from the audience. So this is a question from Lenin Liang. Uh, the question that is that it has become an increasingly prevalent notion that the window of opportunity is closing or has closed for Europe to compete with the U United States and China on the technological front. Now, looking forward, is the technological competition or the lack, of, or the lack thereof going to end up driving a wedge between Europe and the United States? Excellent question. Of course, I'm speaking to you from Silicon Valley. 
the homeland of tech. So at Stanford, every second word is tech. And the, the reality at the cutting edge, in particular in relation to AI, is that Europe is nowhere in relation to the United States and China. The view here is that on AI, the United States is two to three years ahead of China, but Europe hardly features. Britain features a little bit, a couple open mind, a couple of companies there. Um, so that the problem we have is the one we had in relation to the internet, that the Americans do all the innovation and the Europeans do all the regulation, right? And that's a very unhealthy division of labor. It would be actually helpful if the Americans did a bit more regulation and the Europeans did more innovation. But to do innovation on things like large language models, you require scale. And that's a challenge to European integration that in these key industries, at these technological frontiers, the nations of Europe are still not quite ready to go into the same boat. Yeah, Why don't we have one European internet platform? Why don't we have one European AI company? Because where's it gonna be based and who's gonna be leading it? And so I think the, 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 the empirical statement in the question, is correct. And I think the conclusion is quite wrong. The conclusion is precisely the opposite. In a world where we have formidable technological process coming out of China, um, are Europeans really going to cut themselves off from the technologies of tomorrow because they come from the United States? On the contrary, I think the weakness at the technological cutting edge, particularly with AI, is in a sense going to bring the United States and Europe closer together because there will be a relationship of, at least of partial dependency on the side of Europeans, but at the same time, of course, Europe as a large single market and a major global regulator is also going to be very relevant. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's true that there's a big gap, but I think it's probably going to bring us closer together rather than push us apart. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, I'm also talking about when we talk, um, and also I'm thinking about when we're talking about a post-Western order, and and we're still in a way refine, uh, like defining ourselves into the geopolitical and the geographical sense of an order, and maybe that's the future global order that we're facing is a post-human one. So yeah. it's not about West and East anymore in a way. Uh, it's about human technology and human non-human actors, maybe. So I think that in a way that can uh, transform the way in a way that we think about older and and especially political orders. Um, yes, within... I, I would add to that. I would add to that Google, or Facebook, or Apple. Yeah. And the giant internet platforms. By the way, someone told me yesterday that California is now the world's fourth largest economy. Mm, yeah. overtaken Germany because of these extraordinary who is Google's sovereign who yeah. is Apple's sovereign right it poses the question of sovereign and an sovereignty in an absolutely novel way um, so I agree with you that it's now a, a much more complex multi-actor game and as mm. I said the, the, the conclusion from that is we need more global governance and we're getting less of it yeah. And uh, moving on to that, I think uh, the next question is from uh, Wang Yuanhao. And uh, it's actually a series of three questions. So I'm going to uh, make a quick summary of it. Oh. Um, and I think that uh, his or her question is mainly about, in a way, that where did you see the positive aspect? during the current turbulent time? And what might be the future directions of reforms and collaboration on the international level? 
well. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, I think we do ourselves no good by a sort of shallow intellectual optimism, by trying to persuade ourselves that things are better than they are. They're not. We're in very dark times, we're in very difficult times, and it's important to face up to that. So intellectual pessimism can be something very constructive. Um, there's an interesting comparison I like to make. Um, this relates to the, to the West um, uh, with the 1970s. Remember that in the early 1970s, the West seemed to be in a profound crisis. Um, uh, Sam Huntington wrote a book on the crisis of democracy. The United States after Vietnam and Watergate was way down. Its soft power was in ruins, its reputation in ruins. New York was nearly bankrupt. Britain was the sick man of Europe. Many thought the Soviet Union was going to overtake the United States, or at least level peg with the United States. Uh, we had the oil price shock, which ended the 30 years of European economic growth. So that was a period of profound crisis. And because we didn't close our eyes to it, because we didn't code ourselves, because we faced up to how critical the problems were, we made radical reforms, which enabled us to get out to it. So that's so 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 no shallow optimism. Um, points of light, we have, and actually this webinar is an example of this, we have a much more sophisticated international analytical discussion, right? So, and our project is a small contribution to that. You know, the analysis being made in Beijing and Istanbul and Delhi and Berlin and Paris and London and New York it has a great deal of similarity, and it is in many respects a shared analysis. And I think everyone recognizes that we have a unique new set of global challenges. So at least there is analytical insight into the extent of the global challenges and the need for cooperative responses. Um, but against that, of course, you have what you touched on earlier, the tendency to look back, to think about our past centuries of national glory or our past centuries of national humiliation or where our future greatness should be. Um, and that leads one not to be over-optimistic. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we still have three or four questions there. And I think there's a one question from, from Kai which is more about the post-Brexit UK policy, about how, how the UK will looking, look to navigate its foreign policy in a post-Brexit era. And maybe I think, while looking at the question of UK, I always look at it through a different perspective because I kind of look at the question of, of UK about making it itself, keeping a distance away from the regional integration and, and organization yet trying to reposition itself in the globe in the era of globalization or deglobalization in a way. And I think that question in a way also asks that how successful that strategy right now. Um I think six or seven years now after the referendum about did Brexit actually find a way among the European countries about keeping a comfortable distance from the regional organization yet successfully reposition itself in the global era? And I'm afraid the answer is very clear. No. This is increasingly being recognized in the British political debate, even among conservatives. Brexit was the biggest foreign policy mistake made by the United Kingdom, certainly since 1956, since the Suez Crisis, some would say since the 1930s. The economic cost you know, is already very apparent to everyone. But equally apparent is the damage to Britain's international reputation, its influence, its soft power. So 
I think that the answer is a resounding no. Brexit has not produced an alternative model for national success for the United Kingdom. And therefore, you know, just today it was announced that Britain, rather than having its own science funding agenda, has rejoined the European Union's Horizon Science mm-hmm. Funding project because these collaborations are so important. And what you, I mean, a colleague of mine put it, what you're going to see over the next few years is a hundred horizons, right? That's to say a hundred small incremental steps to a more sensible, constructive relationship between Britain and its European neighbours, between Britain and the European Union. Um, But it certainly hasn't been a success. It's very unlikely to be a success. It's not going to be emulated anytime soon by anyone inside the European Union. And it is, of course, rather than a win-win, it's a lose-lose because it's also um, a net loss to to, to, the, to the European Union. Hmm. Yeah. Um, many thanks for that. And um, and maybe I can, again, rephrase uh, one of the questions about the war in Ukraine and the failure of the UN system in a different way. Maybe we can reframe about, um, and because previously people also asked about uh, the 19th century and also early 20th century wars in Europe. Uh, it's about that, again, that we seem to fail to prevent a large scale war in Europe. And what seems to be different, I think, that if we compare that to the previous century and uh, to it right now, is that in the previous century, we would say that the balance of power in Europe fails, or there's a security order in Europe that failed. But nowadays, when we look at the war in Ukraine, we will say that this is a failure in a way of the global security order or the global security system. So what happened in Europe point out the loopholes in the global security system. Uh, so what can be addressed at the European level should be in a way in connection with what can be addressed on the global level. If we cannot address the Ukrainian war on the global level and, for example, try to bridge the different understandings among the BRICS and the European countries uh, without a consensus, is that possible to imagine a functional, working, workingable global security order? I think that is the question there. I, first of all, um, don't I'm afraid, except the premise of your question, Mm. that we need, as it were, a global negotiated solution. Uh, I'm afraid, and I say this with with great regret, we're in one of those moments in history where the only road to a lasting peace leads through war. And actually, Ukraine needs to recover most if not all its sovereign territory Um, and that is the only path to a lasting peace because otherwise you'll have not even a frozen conflict you'll have a semi-frozen conflict um so uh um i i to 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 the immediate point about how the war in ukraine is should be ended should ideally be, be be ended um with of course ideally a conversation with russia about uh, international security in which other powers which have good relations with Russia could play a part. I think there is one quite specific concern here, and it's about nuclear proliferation. Because one thing we did succeed in doing in the post-99 era, with a few exceptions, was upholding the taboo, which of course China has also tried to uphold, on a nuclear proliferation, right? And um, as part of the attempt to prevent nuclear proliferation, we, particularly the West, put very strong pressure on Ukraine to give up its nuclear weapons, which it had in the early 1990s. 
in return for security assurances from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia in the Budapest Memorandum in 1994. I have been talking to colleagues in Ukraine who said there is now again a conversation in Ukraine about whether the country should not try to get nuclear weapons. I have no doubt that that story I've just told, you give up your nuclear weapons and then you get invaded and face this murderous war, is a significant catalyst to nuclear proliferation. And there will be many countries around the world which will be saying, if you have nuclear weapons, don't give them up. If you don't have them, see if you can get them. Mm. And I think that is a really major worry for global security. And that, it seems to me, is an area where we, we, we can have and do need the widest possible cooperation of powers, including powers like China and India, obviously, in upholding the nuclear taboo that nuclear weapons can't be used in the Russo-Ukrainian war and in trying to hold the line against nuclear proliferation. Mm. And that would, of course, also, by the way, in itself be a confidence-building piece of cooperation. Mm. I think that is, in a way, that when I was talking to different counterparts with regard to the Ukrainian war, that is the part I find that it's this maybe area, one of the one of the few areas, which that's among old counterparts I talked to, including the Ukrainian counterpart, they actually admire that what China and India has been doing and has been standing on this ground. Um, despite all the other stances, my European counter uh, my U- Ukrainian counterpart would say that we do appreciate China's stance on the nuclear issues, because China's stance on this has been crystally clear basically, from the very beginning. I I think that's very important. And by the way, um, there's been some interesting reporting on this in the Financial Times by Max Seddon, who's a very well-informed Moscow correspondent, um, who has reported that actually the use of tactical nuclear weapons was contemplated by Putin and his advisors last summer. One one reason they didn't do it is that the military utility is relatively small. Um, But another reason was um, that if anything might lose them the active or at least tacit support of China and India, it would be the use of nuclear weapons. So I think that's an important point. And and to the point about cooperation and competition, I, I, I do think that wherever we can find these areas of cooperation, um, Another is, of course, climate change. Another is AI. We badly need a conversation because the danger of AI, as pointed out by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt and others, is because of its capacity of autonomous development, you get um, unforeseeable and unknown separate developments of AI, also military applications of AI in the United States and in China. So this is another area where I think, you know, cooperation would be very badly needed. Um, And then I think it's important also, if I may say so, to to highlight these areas of cooperation as well as the areas of competition, also for our own public opinion. So you don't get a a vicious circle of growing hostility and grow, growing alienation. Mm. Yeah, and and within the like the project that we we're actually working on with the program, that there used to be at one conference we held, and we talk about the minimalist morality. And I think on the nuclear taboo and uh, maybe on some areas of, of collaboration reflect about what Michael Woods would say, that's the, the minimalist morality that we can still agree upon uh, for for any kind of uh, 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 remnants of internationalism that we're still I, having. I think that's exactly right, kind of minimal universalism. And for liberals like me, this is a difficult challenge because, of course, we like the whole smorgasbord. And in the 1990s, Western liberal discourse was about the whole smorgasbord, right? Mm -hmm. 
And now, you know, you're actually having to make very hard calls about what are the absolute liberals essentials on which there can be no compromise and on what areas, you know, can, 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 can there be compromise? And I, I think it's a, I, I think these are indeed, I think these, these are very difficult um, challenges, but, but of course, um, uh, let me say one more thing on that. A lot of the conversation now is about institutional architecture, right? Mm. UN reform, structures of international organizations, structures of the EU, right? I think that's the wrong place to start. I think you have to start with concrete actions and with what the uh, scholar Andrew Schoenfeld called the habits of cooperation. I think the habits come first and then the institutional changes may follow. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that because in the previous discussion about um, when we talk about the post, you may say post Western order and uh, so on and so forth, when people are imagining um, when and when people are talking about, for example, the reforms in the current global order, one of the first things that they're referring to actually the institutions. When they talk about in the context of China, of course, they will talk about the AIIB, the Belt and Road Initiative, and all the institutional designs behind it. But uh, from my perspective, maybe like the the new order we're entering uh, in is a, a post institutional list order. And exactly what like uh, Professor Gatton has just pointed out that we can have the habit of collaboration or, or cooperative culture first before getting into what kind of institutions that um, we would like to build upon, basically. Yeah I, th yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right, because many of the existing institutions are not fit for purpose. Um, and they are um, not going to be reformed easily. I mean, you know, how long has the debate been about UN reform been going on? But there's no shortage of channels of cooperation, and there's nothing wrong with multiple bilateralism or practice multilateralism yeah and we're coming we're coming we're coming close to the end of the uh the talk and now uh, let me just check whether it's, we do have any audience who want to raise maybe a final question uh or any inquiries that you may still have now if no then um i would like to thank of course again uh, to the organizer the uh, Burgum China Center and also the Burgum Institute and also many thanks to all the audience that who came and, and participate in our talk today and of course the biggest thanks uh, goes to uh, Professor Ganesh and who kindly um, and gave us so much time uh, for talk and also for the discussion um, and uh, just the forecast that we we do look forward to hosting Professor Ganesh next year around the same time um, in China in person. And maybe by that time, we'll, we'll have a China-EU dialogue exactly in format or in the spirit of the habit of the collaboration that we mentioned about today. Um, so thank you again, Professor Ganesh. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Uh, I look forward to being with you in person in Beijing.